Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and how great to have as our guest this morning, Dr. Ron Paul. For the three people in the audience who don't know about Dr. Paul, I'll just say he was, of course, a longtime congressman from Texas, the chairman of the Domestic Monetary Policy Subcommittee, the great champion of the gold standard of international peace, of free markets in public life, of course, a candidate for president again this time. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And author of many books, most recently, and The Fed and Liberty Defined. And Ron, great to have you. And I, I want to ask you about something that's right in the news at this moment that is of special interest to you. What about this whole uh, alleged Iranian terrorism plot and the fact that some people want to use this as an excuse to kill a lot of Iranians? You know, this scares me to no end. Not not being scared of the Iranians or or this guy, but it scares me to death to think that they can take a perfectly lousy misfit who's been uh, a little bit, had bizarre behavior for a long time, all of a sudden get this much attention on the top headline of every newspaper in the country that uh, has put us on the verge of another war. I mean, uh, the reaction is just astounding. I, I hope we can counteract that and try to tone it down. But to think that they'd be, they'd be willing uh, to go to war over this, and, and now they're uh, upping the ante you know, against the Iranians right now, I think this is very, very dangerous. And uh, obviously, though, this is just an excuse to, uh, for them to do what they wanted to do all along, looking for an excuse to go in and, and start uh, tearing up that country. And, of course, it it is alarming, and uh, thank goodness for you that you've been the one voice of reason and of sanity on the whole the whole question. Of course, these people, when Obama or uh, the Republicans, too, say that nothing should be left off the table with Iran, they're talking about just killing everybody. They're talking yeah. about mass murder. Well, when they say nothing left off the table, that means they'd use nukes if they wanted to. And uh, I'm I'm afraid there there are some of those individuals that are quite willing to do that, but... Uh, that's that's why it's very scary, and, and of course it's the old old saying whether it had to do with nine eleven or uh, or Bin Laden or whatever that if you even question it or suggest that there's other ways to do something, then you know we're unpatriotic and we're un-American and, uh, and uh, this constitution means nothing. So uh, I I I go back and forth because there are some days when I'm especially talking to the young people, they're very much attuned into what we've been talking about for years. At the same time, you see the neocons who are still in charge in Washington of both parties, uh, then it, it becomes pretty scary. So I'm just hoping that we can speed up the transition so we can have uh, some thoughtful people involved in Washington rather than uh, the current crop of people we have there now. Ron, you've been the great champion, as I mentioned, of sound money, the great opponent of the central bank as unconstitutional and obviously an economic disaster, a political disaster. But you have really made progress against Greenspan, against Bernanke, against the whole central bank system, and now through your subcommittee. I mean, we're seeing questions asked and people interested in things that they never were interested in before. No, and I, I think that is uh, a lot of progress. But, but you know, uh, institutions like the Mises Institute and others who have been doing the uh, legwork on this for not a year or two, but for a couple decades, I think that is making a difference. I think the fact that we have more teachers than ever before, I keep thinking about how things were in the 19... Uh, 20s and 30s. In the 20s, everybody talked about free enterprise, and Roosevelt ran on free enterprise and the gold standard. At the same time, the intellectual community had changed, and they were all socialists and Keynesians. I hope it's reversed right now, because I think the subtle understanding in the intellectual community has changed away from Keynesianism, and that uh, the that we're winning the intellectual fight. So, in that way, I'm optimistic, but then there are days when you see the insanities that continue that that we don't, uh, you know, we wonder what will happen. But I think the discussion has changed, even though I, I'm sure you noticed I don't get as much time on those debates as oh. others. <laughs> but, but somebody somebody wrote and they said, yeah, but they're always talking about some of the issues that I brought up. So if they're talking about the Fed, but the, the, it does get a little aggravating when they talk about the Fed and they distort it or they try to tone it down, and I want my chance to clarify something. Sometimes it's very hard to get my two words in. Well, I must say at this at this recent debate, at Dartmouth, I thought they were so outrageously biased against you that it actually hurt them. 
I mean, they're <laughs> discussing all these issues that are your specialties and uh, pretending you don't exist. So I think every, I think you know, certainly all the people I talked to's reaction, uh, even people who don't agree with you 100 percent, thought that it was un- just a crime what uh, Charlie Rose uh, was doing, and of course he. He represents the establishment. Establishment's scared of you. And just look at, I mean, there was a recent article in The in, in the Economist by a guy blaming you. For, he said Bernanke hasn't d- given us all the money creation and credit creation that he should have to, sa- to save us all because Ron Paul has introduced all these terrible ideas and is restricting Bernanke. So, you know, I think he had actually a point. I mean, Bernanke does feel under pressure. He does feel under scrutiny like no Fed chairman, I think, has, has ever been. And that's because well, of you. I was always delighted, uh, you know, when he had to answer back and go and have press conferences and other things. So he he has a full-time PR person now, you know, trying to portray him in the media in a certain way. But it used to be very secret, and they didn't have to do that. Well, they're they're still way too secret, but at least we're exposing their uh, secrecy that uh, keeps keeps the people from knowing exactly what they've been up to. You know, I thought something else you were responsible for. There was a recent program on the History Channel asking whether there's any gold in Fort Knox. And they treated you fairly. And uh, I thought there was something to be gained just by the fact that they asked the question, you know, is it coin melt? Is it uh, is all the gold there? Even if the gold is all there, who owns it? Uh, and this is the issue you've raised. And, you know, it's, it's a great thing to see in the mainstream media t- uh, taking something like this seriously. Yeah, and I'm sure you remember when we were working on the Gold Commission, I brought the subject up back then. We were talking about the gold in relationship to the monetary system because there was a crisis going on then, and it, the vote was uh, uh, 15 to 2 against auditing the gold. Here we're studying the gold in relationship to the monetary system, and nobody wanted to find out if we owned any of the gold yet. So, But uh, more and more people are starting to understand this. Uh, of course, my position on that is not so much to worry about how they're going to reinstate their gold standard. I just assume they sell the gold and, let, and legalize its use in this country. And uh, I think that transition would work better than pretending that we can uh, phase out the Fed and institute another pseudo-gold standard, which I think some are working on. You know, They'll, they'll, they'll talk about, uh, well, maybe we can use a little bit of gold in this new standard and the IMF can manage it. Uh, that, uh, that's, I think, is the thing that we have to be on alert for. You know, thinking of the IMF, I remember back a few years when Henry Royce, who was the chairman of the House Banking Committee, I guess then, was advocating more money for the IMF, and you suggested, well, why doesn't the IMF just sell its gold? <laughs> and, of course, he freaked out, right? They all fr- freaked out at yeah. having this question asked. But isn't that a good question right now, too? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, Henry Royce was the great economist who said if you ever legalize gold, he says that would be good because gold, we prop up the price of gold. If we legalized it, the gold would go down to $5 an ounce. So he missed <laughs> that call a little bit, too. <laughs> Ron, you know, the what's happening in your campaign is so exciting. And I, I remember four years ago when you were at the Values Voters Summit, and after you said that you worship the Prince of Peace, they booed you. This time it was a little bit different. This time you won the straw poll, you had the crowd chanting for you, and you, you talked about how war affects the family. If people are concerned about, about the status of the family, they can't be for these perpetual wars. And people liked what you had to say. So wh- what's going on? I mean, is even among these people that uh, your ideas are starting to penetrate? Well, you know, the managers of that convention explained it all. Uh, we st- the ones who counted the ballots claim we stuffed the ballot box, <laughs> and it was a gross distortion. No, I think the sentiment has changed. The attitude on the war has changed in these last four years. People are getting tired of it, and I think some of these factual things that I pointed out, uh, even though they're in the religious realm and they're, they're biblical, but that's the kind of conference that we were having there. As a matter of fact, uh, they, they ask us not to be political because they are a 51C3, I think the others didn't hesitate for a minute to be talking about the president and, and you know, talking about campaigns. So I tried to stay on that theme. But, uh, of course, a lot of our supporters went that had a little different view and had a, had a more a different understanding of the First Amendment and, and how, how we should, uh, you know, uh, treat religious values. But, uh, no, I think there has been a shift. I think the attitude has changed against the war. And uh, and we all know exactly what their policies do. And I didn't get to mention it in there. I probably could have. And, and that is how these wars 
are detrimental to not only family life in these countries that we're bombing, but to the Christian values. I mean, how many countries have we run out to Christians? Christians were in Iraq for, what, a couple thousand years? From the very and beginning. now they've practically been run out. The same thing in Afghanistan. No, and the same thing is going to happen in Syria. If the U.S. efforts succeed there, all the Christians who've been who've been in Syria since the very beginning of Christianity will be killed or uh, certainly ethnically cleansed. You know, this this po- is point points out that if you live in a community, say in one of these far eastern countries where Christians and Jews and Muslims have lived, uh, you know, alongside each other and actually intermarried, and it, not a problem. It, it there's more tolerance than when they're your neighbors. But when outsiders come in, when the Christian crusaders come in and say, this is what we believe in and this is what we're going to do, those who identify themselves as Christian then become part of the outsiders and then they get turned on. So it is this uh, uh, outsider approach once we go into these countries that totally destroys the fabric of their society where they were much more tolerant until we got there. Myself, I don't think it's any coincidence that the U.S. has targeted the secular Arab regimes, the non-fundamentalist regimes, whether we're talking Iraq or Syria or even Egypt, and uh, has been in- involved in installing uh, the most radical Islamic elements. And that's because, of course, empires like the U.S. benefit when they can divide and conquer, when they can cause trouble, when they can cause people hating each other and fighting each other internally. It's more easy for the empire to control things. Yeah, that, that was certainly true when the the Iranians were moving toward democracy and had a democratic elected leader in the 50s, uh, you know, we throw him out and put in a dictator, and that leads to the radicalization, and now look at what we have uh, running uh, Iran. And that was a consequence of us interfering with a secular state that would have been more tolerant. And, uh, we, you know, how protective they are of, of the Saudi Arabian dictatorship, which is one of the most vicious dictatorships, uh, just like Bahrain. But the, nobody nobody seems to mind that. Yeah, and then you see the uh, Saudis right now want to really come down. That means the United States has to come down real hard on the Iranians because they were threatening to kill their, their ambassador. Uh, but the, uh, under that kind of logic... How come we didn't come down very hard on the Saudis when 15 of their people came and attacked us and killed all those people on 9-11? But uh, no, what did we do? We, uh, the bin Laden family that still remain in this country, we, we ushered them out of the country and made sure they got back to Saudi Arabia without even asking them any questions. So I don't, I don't know how they get away with such inconsistencies, but uh, you know, and it's probably mostly because of the propaganda that goes through the major media that uh, lets them get away with it. Run. One of the few times they allowed you to speak at that last debate, you skewered Herman Cain, who of course is former Fed official, longtime pro-Fed, anti-audit the Fed, doesn't like the Fed being criticized, defends, you know, uh, Alan Greenspan is a great guy. <laughs> you asked the right question and he, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to say he lied, but he certainly gave an incorrect answer in response to you. He didn't tell the truth. There, there, was, there was no doubt about it. And, and you know that I don't enjoy personalizing any of this stuff. But one reason why that was a lot easier is because he was quoted quite frequently in in the media of being very, very nasty to those many young people who have been strong supporters of the gold standard and anti-fad and has supported me. So that was really what was under my skin at that time, because, you know, being in politics, you get hammered all the time, and uh, I try to just let that go by. But but he's he's probably one of the ones that have attacked uh our support, as a matter of fact, he had made some nasty remarks about me as well. Uh, so I think that was uh, probably uh, the reason. But it was also appropriate because it's a very important issue. Uh, because he he's bragging about being the non-politician. How political <laughs> do you think you have to be to be appointed to the Fed? I mean, that's about as political as you get. Matter of fact, that's more powerful politics than it is getting elected to an office. <laughs> you that's know? right. So he's pretending to be this outsider. Also, the annoying thing about uh, the the Cain proposal is certainly this idea, and I w- had this in mind that if I had more time, I would have asked that, and I went back and forth on what to ask him, but I chose the Federal Reserve. This whole idea of he's going to, if, if he had his way, he would go down in history as the person that started the national sales tax without touching the income tax, and uh, th- this would be 
such a dramatic change from this, and yet most Americans don't want a national sales tax on top of the income tax, but uh, so far he's getting a lot of pretty good publicity for that, and the media has been pumping him up. Although I did notice uh, his typical deer in the headlights look when he was asked who his economic advisor was, and of course he, he has none, but I thought uh, I was wishing that they could have asked you that question because, of course, you're your own economic advisor. <laughs> You've read everything. You know all this. You're the one guy in public life who really understands real economics. Yeah, it's, it, that, that reminds me of when they ask um, Romney a question on his military. Uh, what would you do on this uh, sort of thing? He says, well, I would check with my generals. And, you know, I suggested very strongly at that debate, I said, but I thought the president was supposed to be the commander-in-chief, <laughs> you know, to make these decisions. But, uh, yeah, uh, but there are, I mean, I'm certainly open to advice and explanations. I think we all have to continue to learn, so that uh, that is important. But uh, I appreciate the compliment that uh, you give me for saying I do understand a little bit about economics anyway. Boy, <laughs> you are an economist. I mean, you may not have the degree, but you are an economist, and... It's, I can't tell you how thrilling it is to have you talk about the business cycle, about central banking, about all the various things the government does and what, what the inevitable results of them are, that they can't actually violate the laws of reality and that more of these Keynesian spending programs. I'll just end up with one thing I heard David Frum, who is not a Ron Paulian, shall we say, on television yesterday representing the Republican position on a question, and he said, he said, uh, you know, he's slightly alarmed because, of course, the one key jobs program we need is a massive increase in money creation and credit creation. He said, but he was concerned that there were elements, primitive economic elements, people who believed in a primitive monetary policy who were against a massive explosion, additional explosion in uh, money and credit. So he was worried it might not happen. Well, yeah. this was, of course, a backhanded tribute to you because, of course, you have awakened people. You have opened their eyes to what not only is this bad economically, but it's a ripoff that what the Fed is doing is ripping off regular people for the benefit of the big banks. Right. It isn't amazing that they don't reconcile it with the current news, uh, even today, that uh, real incomes are down about 8% in the last 10 years. Who does that hurt the most, the poor and the middle class? And yet uh, it's precisely because uh, they advocate and have been practicing this whole thing about just, well, we'll increase money and credit so that we can finance debt, and this will take care of the middle class, and we'll give them all these programs. At the same time, their standard of living goes down. It proves the Austrian viewpoint and Mises' point, uh, viewpoint that inflation, destruction of currency, always destroys the middle class, and there's a transfer of wealth from the middle class and the poor over to the to the rich. And, uh, of course, I think this is something that we have to really work at in trying to explain these people who are complaining about Wall Street, that they complain about the right things on Wall Street and not just from complaining about people who are making, uh, you know, a good income. And, of course, as you have pointed out uh, a, a while ago as well as now, the American family's uh, income is down ever since Nixon abolished the last uh, remnants of the gold standard and the Fed was empowered to print as much money as it wanted to print. Yeah, that was unleashing it. <laughs> Dr. Ron Paul, thank you and thanks. Keep up the good work and keep up your writing and your speaking and you're our champion. So thank uh, you, Lou. we're all cheering you. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the upper right-hand corner of the LRC front page. Thank you.